Hello and welcome to Rome Reports Premium. I'm Sean Patrick Lovett and welcome to another in our series of conversations where we bring together inspiring individuals from all over the world to discuss a topic and to, to bring their insights to an issue that we consider particularly important at this time. Now, the family is important at any time and at all times, but Pope Francis has decided to remind us just how important by calling for a year of reflection dedicated to the family. He announced the initiative on December the 27th during the Angelus in the Vatican. During the Angelus on the Feast of the Holy Family, the Pope made an important announcement. He said that next March 19th would be the inauguration of the year dedicated to the family. The motive behind it is to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the publication of the Amoris Letizia document. It will conclude on June 26, 2022 with the 10th World Meeting of Families. It will be an opportunity to approfondire the contenuti del documento. Fin d'ora invito tutti ad aderire alle iniziative che verranno promosse nel corso dell'anno e saranno coordinate dal Dicastero per i Laici Famiglia e Vita. The Pope took the opportunity of the Feast of the Holy Family to recall how important it is to preserve unity in the family and that there should always be forgiveness. È vero, in ognuna delle famiglie ci sono dei problemi, eh? e anche dalle volte si litigano e padre ho litigato ma siamo umani siamo debili deboli e tutti abbiamo dalle volte queste questo fatto che litighiamo in famiglia io vi dire una cosa se litighiamo in famiglia che non finisca la giornata senza fare la pace the Pope also said that this year will be an occasion to reflect on the family and its role on people's education. Good. Well, we have three educators and family experts joining us from the United States right now. Right now, it's my joy, pleasure, and delight to be able to introduce you to them. Uh, Helen Alvarez, she's a professor of law at George Mason University in Virginia. She teaches family law, law and religion, and property law. She publishes regularly on marriage, parenting, and the First Amendment religion clauses. She travels the world when COVID allows her, addressing conferences on these and other issues. And she's a member of the Vatican Dicastery for Laity, Family and Life. Helen, what have I forgotten? <laughs> Nothing except that if you looked into my own family life, people would say, really, is she an expert? <laughs> we all do our best. And I thank God for the Pope saying that. <laughs> And, and of course, I, I didn't mention your various books and articles that range from father absence to domestic violence. And, and I even saw one regarding the true significance of wedding cakes. But, but maybe that, that we'll talk about that another time. Um, Kathy, Kathy O'Donnell. Kathy is an educator. She's a role model. She's the mother of nine children. She's also personal advisor, confident, and counselor to the president of Christendom College, which is a, a Catholic liberal arts college in Front Royal, Virginia. Kathy, um, how many grandchildren? I, I've lost count. Uh, we have 15 grandchildren. Number 16 is overdue, so we're waiting. We may get a call while we're here, but yeah, blessed with it. Even, why, why, wouldn't that be exciting if number 16 it arrived while we're- Then maybe I'd have to leave. <laughs> Timothy, Timothy O'Donnell, <laughs> Timothy O'Donnell is president of Christendom College, where he teaches courses in history and theology. Uh, in 2002, St. John Paul II appointed him consultor to what was then the Pontifical Council for the Family. Um, you might have guessed, but yet he's the father of those nine children and soon to be 16 grandchildren. Um, he was the first layperson to receive his doctorate in mystical theology from the Pontifical Angelicum University in Rome. And that's where I met him and Kathy uh, over 40 years ago. So it's good to see you, Timothy. Good to see you, John. 
Thank you. Did, did I get that all right? I the, the dates and, and, and qualifications. Yes. Okay. So yeah. 2000 and, <laughs> 2021, a year to strengthen the family. Now that's the topic that we're here to discuss. Uh, and if you're joining us online, and I thank you for taking the time out to do that, uh, it's probably because you, like us, believe that this is a topic worth discussing. Now, Helen, Kathy, and Timothy, you all responded very positively to our Rome Report's invitation to be part of this conversation. But if I may ask, what were the first thoughts that went through your mind when you saw the title of the topic. Ladies first, Helen. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I've been gratified throughout the Francis Papacy at the amount of his attention to this topic because I am convinced not only in my own life, you know, I've been married for 36 years now, my, my kids are grown, uh, I, I come from a very large family. I, I have seen in my own life, but I've also seen because I closely follow national and international data on the family, that there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot of need uh, and that it is closely tied to a lot of the social upheaval and social promise that we're seeing. Um, you know, a second thought was that there's an awful lot of good news to discuss and, um, and a lot of different, whether it's private employers, the church, the government, has some good moves. Uh, and, um, and my final thought was that I really would like to see the church be able to explicate what is truly excellent teaching on this subject, not only because it's true and not only because it's very inspiring, but also because if you keep up with the empirical data about the family, the church's prescription could have a real impact. It comports mm -hmm. with what empirical data says is supportive of families. So those were my many cascade of thoughts there. Those are your immediate impressions. Kathy, when you saw the title? Um, first of all, Sean, thank you so much for asking me. Unlike the two other guests, um, I'm not an expert. I don't have degrees. Um, Nine children well, doesn't make you an expert. Well, experience, I guess. Um, <laughs> But also, I must tell you, the document, Amoris Laetitiae, yeah, I think it is such a beautiful document. I, I was kind of blown away. I must say, I think it's a love letter to families. Mm -hmm. And so I was really, I'm kind of excited about the thought of, yes, pushing this for people to read it, to study it together, even either, you know, married lit people, but also lay people, because we are all in this together in terms of strengthening the family. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, it, it, at times it brought me to tears at times it, it was very challenging. So, um, I think that one of the best things we can do to strengthen the family is really delve into this document and study it. And, uh, we will be, we will be, we're going to be coming back specifically to, to the document, uh, later on in the, in the program. Uh, Timothy, your immediate impressions, that title 2000. 21 a year to strengthen the family. What, what were you thinking? Well, what we learn to love. And love is really what it's all about. Uh, to the extent that we find love, the extent that we experience it, we find happiness. And that's what's in our DNA. All of us are programmed that God put this in us, this desire for happiness and love. And the family is the spot where that takes place. And of course, it is the basic building block of society. As the family goes, so goes the church, so goes society. Mm -hmm. So if society is struggling now, if there's struggles in the church, the solution really comes back to what can we do to strengthen our families, mothers and fathers, children. And of course, there'll always be disagreements, but you know that sort of sense of tough love and working things through and recognizing love isn't just a feeling, it's something that resides in the will and it's so deep. And when it's communicated effectively in the family, the impact that that has on the larger society and on the church is phenomenal. So I was really thrilled that we're gonna really try to look at what can we do to strengthen this divine and natural you know, foundation for society. 
And, and thank you for quoting St. John Paul II there, as the family goes, so goes the world, right? Yeah. Um, strengthen, I think, is, is the key word in that. That's certainly what, what struck me. We've, we've all been part of discussions that focus on the doom and gloom of family life. We've been over the numbers again and again, how few people choose to get married nowadays, how many people get separated and divorced. But I, I like that word strengthen, it implies hard work and commitment, kind of like getting up and, and doing press-ups in the morning, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I must say, Sean, um, one thing that I'm seeing in terms of to do with strengthening is that it's true there's the crisis in the family, and we've talked about it, but what I'm seeing with my children and their children is there's incredibly new creative ways that they're coming up to deal with this in their own um, communities. And it struck me, love is creative. And as the Holy Father said, you know, love is at the center of the family, which I just love that, you know, love, and then also because there's love, there's mercy. That um, it's actually an opportunity that uh, for us to come through and put into, show the world, if you will, um, what you can create, what you can do, what the family can do, how we can strengthen each other and come to way in different ways. They're not gonna be able to raise their families the way say we raised our families. Their challenges are different. But what I'm seeing is they are coming up community-based things um, with the women, you know, uh, strengthening each other in their roles, mothers, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of things that, that I would add to that. Um, I always take great heart from the fact that when people are surveyed, not by you know conservative or religious survey organizations, but your big national organizations here in the United States, you find that people understand that the family needs to be strong in order for individuals to be happy and in order for them to be free, in order them to have a standard of living that can really take care of the family. Um, so you have a lot of aspirations for good family life. Sometimes I think I take a ridiculous amount of hope from the fact that every single commercial on television, Christmas season is a particular time of this, depicts the family that everybody really wants to have. And it is the family of unconditional, they're in tough times, there to celebrate, there to share, you know, when you're sorry, um, family. Um, we see in the United States data showing that women would actually like to have more children than they're currently having. And, and that to me was really a revelation. Um, the government is a, a little more troubling. Um, in the United States, they're all about strengthening the individual, not so much the family. Um, they refuse to acknowledge what really the consensus of data is, is that children do best with stably married parents. Um, but uh, the church is trying to step up and do everything they can to uh, send that message out, to fill in the gap. Um, it's hard because the government doesn't just talk about the individual, but sometimes it actively derides, you know, the stable married family. Um, but the church really is stepping up. Um, in the United States, we have efforts at the USCCB level, that is the National Bishops Conference, We've got them at the diocesan level. There's private organizations um, raising money from both Catholic and evangelical churches called um, one effort I'm part of called Communio um, that's going into churches to strengthen marriage and family. So I I'm heartened by sort of a gut recognition at the grassroots level by church efforts. And I'm hoping that these eventually translate into demands on governments and corporations to support the family. Um, we know it's what people want. Not just yes, what they what they want and what they what they need. So how how would I recognize a strong family if if I met one apart from the the Christmas uh, advertisements? For for someone like we all remember Father Patrick Payton and and uh, Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta. It was the family that prays together, stays together. But what are some of the other elements that, that are telltale signs of a, of a strong family? Maybe, maybe there are people watching us and listening to us right now who are, who are already living in a strong family, they just don't know it. In some ways, it all just seems so natural, but uh, 
course, there's many things that you, you'll notice. Certainly, uh, the love for the spouses, you know, for, for each other. But I do think one of the key things that the Pope hits on in the document, and it's very much part of the whole Christian tradition down through the centuries, is the notion of a domestic church. And I think you brought up Father Peyton. I think that's a great point that the idea that the family that prays together stays together because prayer involves not only adoration, but it involves an exercise of faith, hope, charity, mutual forgiveness, all of those things. And so the idea that, you know, faith is lived is just something that would be a Sunday experience when you go to mass and receive the Eucharist as wonderful and as beautiful as that is. But the idea that it shouldn't stop there, that that should actually be something that's part of the fabric of the home. Prayer is the air we breathe. If we're not praying together on a regular basis, we will die of asphyxiation. Uh, and so to actually have a situation where a family feels comfortable praying together, even something simple like before mom and dad go off to work, to have family get together and maybe pray a morning offering. A, well, I've got a soccer match today. What do we pray for? A soccer match. I've got an exam today. I'm trying out for a play and a, a part in a play. Let's take that to the Lord and give it to him. And when they see that the parents are actually living this in a concrete way and manifesting their love and channeling that relationship and that love to the heart of Christ, that can be a very, very beautiful, powerful thing. So I think one of the great signs of a strong family is prayer. Because honestly, I think just on a natural level, given the pressures we're facing today, families can't really make it unless there is a real opening to grace. And that type of grace comes primarily through prayer. And I think that's a great way to help strengthen families and keep them together. I would add that a sign that a family is strong is that they play together. Uh, they enjoy oh, each other's Pray company. together and, and play together. But, that's that's uh, nice. They that's... Both, you know, games, cards, um, even, you know, even outdoor camping or hiking together or, you know, some kind of sports together. But, you know, you see that closeness when you see these the families that are out doing physical, you know, let's let's game of basketball together or even then playing music together. For sure. um, these things are, you know, you can just there is a closeness that comes from that when you're just interacting, even on those that aren't, say, well, in my position, it was like, well, am I teaching them something? Am I praying with them? But then this is the other creative side with your brain where you're OK, now um, getting to know them in a different way, having fun together. I think I would add to this um, a family who reconciles children who are struggling or have fallen or um, and making sure that everyone in the family steps in to support that person. The, and, and that really has to begin even when the kids are pretty young. Um, there's whether it's a failure in school, whether it's a moral failure. Um, whether it's some you know, great personal offense in the household. Um, one of the things that I've seen in families that sort of have made it for, for decades uh, and in my own family is you tell every one of those kids, you ask the aunt and uncles, you solicit some of the cousins who are willing to step in and help that child, uh, to help that, that, that aunt or uncle, et cetera, um, when something has happened that uh, they know that the love of Christ, which is what families are supposed to manifest, you're supposed to be able to think about your parents, your siblings. Oh, this is a glimpse of what God's love looks like. So, so Jesus is not a 2,000-year-old memory. He's, I see something extraordinary here. Maybe I see it in a friend, maybe I don't. But I definitely see it in my family that, that comes to surround me when something has gone horribly wrong. Um, and I, I think that's a trait that I've seen, I think, in my, in my own family, and I've definitely seen it in the families that over decades I regard as, as models. So if your family prays together and plays together and has a mutually supportive system, then you are living in a strong family, and that's, that's good news. Uh, of course, the challenge is now to go out there and show other people how, how it's done. Um, okay, we promised that we would talk about Amoris Laetitia, and, and uh, we try to keep our promises. Um, as you heard earlier, Pope Francis himself calling for 2021 to be a year of reflection on the family because 
2021 marks five years since the publication of his apostolic exhortation. That's, that's a lovely, those are lovely words, aren't they? Apostolic, this idea of going, going out and exhortation, the idea of invitation to, to come in. His apostolic exhortation, Amoris Letizia, on the beauty and the joy of love in the family. It's the document that was the result of two synods of, on the family in 2014 and 2015. And that's why this year-long celebration is being called Amoris Letizia Family year. So um, don't tell anyone, but the last time I read it was five years ago, um, and I picked it up again in preparation for this conversation. And maybe it's because I'm five years older, or, or maybe certain passages just resonate differently with me right now, but I feel I appreciated it much more in second reading now than I did then. There are certain passages which are, which are almost poetic. The life of every family is marked by all kinds of crises, yet these are also part of its dramatic beauty. So I was wondering if um, any of you have had the occasion to reread it, and it sounds like you have, and uh, what were the passages that stood out for you? Timothy. Well, I think I'll let her talk more about that, but chapter four, uh, where he had that beautiful reflection on the Pauline passage on the nature of love, that love is kind. It was so beautiful that I thought, what a great thing to use in marriage preparation or renewal, because it really brings out in, this, in, in a concrete way by focusing on what real love looks like and what it feels like. Uh, the sacramental nature of marriage. That really moved me tremendously. And that was very helpful to me. I liked it when I read it the first time, but it hit me even more this time. I think when it first came out, unfortunately, I think the reading of the document got sandbagged by chapter eight and, and things like that. But I think a, a healthier, more balanced reading of what you're seeing in here, it is a beautiful presentation. And uh, the Pope is really fulfilling here his mandate to strengthen the brethren. And what greater way than by trying to strengthen uh, the family. But I think it really is written with a sense of the pastor's heart that he really wants to try to help families that are struggling. And I think his image of the field hospital, you know, the idea that the church in her teaching does have medicine. It does have the personnel and the medicine that can really help people who are wounded and are suffering. And so I think chapter four really had a big impact on me. And also the last chapter, chapter nine, we're talking about the spirituality of the family. And again, hitting very hard on the notion of domestic church, because I think most people don't even know what the term is or what it actually means. But I think there were many, many lay people, married couples out there that if they heard that they were a domestic church, that their love is meant to mirror in a beautiful way, the love that Christ has for his church and therefore making it incumbent upon men to be willing to sacrifice in service and to lay down instead of some kind of macho thing, I'm in charge, is there? No, it's a call to serve and to give of oneself in love. And how wonderful it is then when the, you can also see that the woman is the heart of the home, has a capability there of sharing and manifesting the beauty of the church as well. So. Chapter four was big and chapter nine was really big for me, but. Well, yes, I, we had discussed how beautiful his meditation on uh, the Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind. I actually think that would be a incredible meditation for religious, you know, um, single people besides married people, so beautiful. Another theme that ran through was because since the marriage does show love, and that mystery that it, 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 is, it mirrors the, you know, Christ and his church, that mercy has to be at the heart of it. And this touches upon something that Helen said, that yes, it's how we respond, take care of the children or any other, you know, relative, a niece or a nephew, perhaps, aunt or uncle, who's fallen away, something's gone wrong and in many ways, physically handicapped, morally handicapped, mentally handicapped, and how you care for them. And it's such a great witness then for the 
everyone else in the community of your family to see, well, is this what it would happen to me if I somehow disappointed or did something wrong? So the whole idea of mercy, because I think that is like the key because we all fail. One of the things about the document is so beautiful, but it's so demanding. I mean, at points I was saying, oh, this is a love letter to the family. And other times I was like, there's just no way I can do this. I mean, you're supposed to nurture your children and take care of them. And then in the, also then go out, be somewhere to the rest of the society. And I'm like, how can you do all that? But just the idea of mercy and showing forgiveness, I thought was very key. It, it is, it is a light motif, is it? Mercy that runs, that runs through it. Let us care for one another. Let us guide and encourage one another and experience this as part of our family spirituality, it says. Helen, what's your favorite passage? I, I think it's paragraph 35. Um, and it talks about, let's not just complain all the time, let's do something. <clears throat> and that's, that's very much uh, my personality. <laughs> I like to complain, yeah, but I, I like to have plans to get something done. Um, I, I have a sister who successfully run a business for 40 years, and she always says, let's not just talk about it, let's just do it, and let's stop talking about it completely, let's just do it. And that very much resonated with what needs to be done, because everybody, the, the amount of hand-wringing, and we need to quantify, know what the problem is, but we got to move forward. And I think um, in the same spirit of this was, I think it's chapter six that talks about pastoral preparation for marriage. <clears throat> I have been shocked for years that there isn't more remote preparation for marriage. I mean, when I think of what is done for a priest or a sister, when I think of what I do for law students, <clears throat> when I think of how we prepare our children to get a job, when in fact, if their family life is, is in disarray, their, their work, their finances, <clears throat> their mental happiness will be displaced. There's, it's, it's, it's core for not only their good, but their, their mental and every other kind of flourishing. So I like the idea of this more remote preparation and I hope it gets uh, undertaken. I also love the idea of mentorships that it discusses. Um, again, I mean, I, my marriage, I feel like it's been easy. I married my best friend who I met when I was 17. Um, but yeah, it's been, is that the case for you too? Oh my gosh, whoa. Uh, that is merciful. I married the guy you meet at 17. Um, but, but still, the amount of ups and downs in life with children in the larger family, um, to have a mentor. I had a brother who was, uh, I'm the youngest of five, he's 12 years older than me, and I would often just turn to him and say, okay, Charles, what do you think? And he was a mentor to me, as were my older sisters, as were my parents, uh, my father in particular, um, I was close to as a, you know, my whole life um, would give me very particular advice. Um, I would love having it from people I admire in my own parish. And um, I, I get it at an individual level a lot, not so much at the family level. We haven't been so attuned to it. From time to time, I remember <clears throat> we were suffering sort of a rash of divorces at one point in the Catholic um, parish school that my kids went to. And, uh, you know, different people in the parish were more and less receptive to mentoring these couples. And I thought, I, I don't get a no here. I don't understand how that's an option. <laughs> um, so the, the focus on, on remote and continuing marriage preparation was, was very good. And I hope that it is, you know, continued and stressed during this year of the family. Mm. We're, we're getting also... a question here. Sorry, we're, we're just, we're getting a question here. Don't you think that the parish isn't doing enough to show the bright side of marriage and the family? Well, that's one of the reasons why we're here. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to do with this conversation. Sorry, Kathy, I didn't want to interrupt you, what you were saying. Um, no, I think also, and the Pope mentions this, uh, the idea of what, with Helen saying mentorship, grandparents. Um, so this, this is just from personal experience. Uh, my mother passed away a couple months ago. 
She had six children, 51 grandchildren. And now they're still working on maybe up to 90 some great grandchildren. And she had a great life. She died at 90 and it was a you know beautiful life. But we, we were, there was 120 people at the funeral, all family. And the priest who did the homily had gone around and talked to the grandchildren and said, they, the grandchildren I say had a particularly love for their grandmother. I think she, she could talk to each of them. She uh, really paid attention to them as adults I and mean, maybe their parents didn't always. Um, I think they all thought they were her favorite grandchild. Um, so uh, he, the priest went around and said, how, and now they're all having these grandchildren, beautiful families of their own. They believe in it a lot. And he said, how, how did she do this? Did she teach you your catechism? You know, what did she do? No, and it wasn't that she talked so much about, you know, teaching them the, their catechism or that type of thing. It was just that she lived it. And I think they felt unconditional love from her. So obviously this can be a huge thing as you see. And this is from someone who, her parents were divorced when she was two and my father's parents were divorced. So both my parents came from, you know, uh, divorced families. But it didn't mean it doesn't mean it's always going to be a bad thing. They made a very big commitment that family would be central. So to show you, there's always hope. I mean, it's kind of an amazing story. It is. It is an amazing story, Kathy. Yeah. Can give an example of acceptance, encouragement, uh, prayer, and show that there is such a thing as a love that really does last. And that's important for people to see that and to know that. And that's why I think Pope Francis called for. We want to communicate the ideal. Because we want to mm -hmm. find the ideal and the real, and people need to strive. If we don't know what the goal is, we don't know what that ideal is, we don't even strive for that. And I think he's very beautiful in setting forth, this is the ideal. This is the reality that we want to be embracing and grasping. Not always easy, very, very challenging. But I think a lot of times, grandparents have a very big role to play in helping to communicate that to a newer generation that maybe is struggling with broken marriages, broken promises, and broken relationships. Well, I, I'm greatly looking forward to the experience of being a grandfather. Right now, I'm just the biological father of, of two sons. And as such, both my sons and my students um, often challenge, not to mention criticize me, because they say, I, when I'm talking about family, I tend to talk over their heads. They, they criticize me for failing to acknowledge their own experience, presuming to know what it's like to be a new family, a, a millennial or, or Generation Z family. So, so I thought we might ask them, it might be interesting to hear directly from one of those grandchildren you mentioned, Kathy. And so I'd like to add another voice to our conversation. His name is uh, Kieran, Kieran O'Donnell. Um, hello, Kieran, welcome. <laughs> Um, I have permission to tell you his age. Kieran is 25, his wife Cynthia is 23, and Aurora, their baby girl, turns one this month. And, and no, Kieran's parents did not know that he would be joining us. It was something of a last minute decision on Get my part, ball, but I'm delighted Get you could. Ball. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you for coming in on the conversation. Have you been listening? I have not been able to. I am actually currently at work. This is my little remote office space that I set up for the monks and kind of, the uh, monks. basically which monks are you working with? Forms because it's a uh, tax business. I'm all working right. with the Holy Cross Abbey monks. They're my Cistercians and they're all, you know, they don't like doing math, so they hire me to do it for them. I understand. I, I yeah. Do, do you have a picture of Cynthia and Aurora there with you? Can we at least see what your family look, what your Generation Z family looks like? Yeah, I actually do. If I could, sure, sure, sure. If you could actually you could hold like, it up, hold it up to, to your screen screen camera if you can. I could. Well, don't 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 get don't get techy. Just just hold it up to the camera if you <laughs> if you can. Otherwise. I just, will, just to remind you avoid the techiness so okay that is my wife and i and that is my grumpy little girl right there Your grumpy little girl <laughs> who turns a year old this month you said right yes indeed it's so pretty now we're, great we're, she we're, is adorable she i'm sure she is <laughs> okay <laughs> 
<laughs> Kieran, we're here talking about the family. And so I have to ask you how your and Cynthia's family prepared you to make this commitment to get married at 25 and, and 23 and, and to, to have children. Yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned the uh, ha having children part because I think that was one of the things that really centered Cynthia and I when we were both like getting ready and dating was the fact that we want to have a family, we want to have children. And I think growing up in my family with, you know, nine siblings, and her family with six siblings, we just kind of knew both in like a theoretical doctrinal way, like, yes, the Catholic Church teaches we should have, you know, like we should be open to life. But on top of that, we like knew it in our bones in pleasant and unpleasant ways that, you know, we want that, you know, glorious family life. And, you know, I think that, I that's kind of the, the, growing up in the. Yeah, uh, yeah sorry, don't keep going. The, the example of the. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, curious to have, 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 having that example is the best thing. Have you or Cynthia ever faced criticism from peers uh, for making this choice? My favorite thing is when she goes to work and her coworkers say to her, oh my gosh, how you want, and she's like, how many kids do you want? She's like, I'd like, you know, nine or 12. And they're like, oh my gosh, like, what does your husband think? She's there like, he wants 15. Like, <laughs> she just totally ups the ante. And, Mostly it's just kind of this like confusion, but also just like they can see we're like radiantly joyful about it. And it's more just like that doesn't seem to add up in their brain because for them, kids is kind of the thing you do to kind of, you know, grow up and, you know, maybe one or two if you're feeling special. But I mean, it's just that kind of like experience we have growing up with a big family. Like, yes, there are challenges and there are a few downsides, but I mean, the positives just so far outweigh the any of the negatives is just not even a question for me and Cynthia's mind, so. Part of the conversation that you missed out on was us trying to decide what are the elements that, that compose a, how would you know you, you were in a strong family if you were living there? And we said, it's praying together, playing together and, and having a strong support system. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, that's definitely things Cynthia and I try to do, um, make sure we get at least one decade of the rosary in together. Um, playing together, Cynthia and I always try to make sure we work out at least once a week together. Um, with, uh, we do some mixed martial arts in local in town. It's really fun. Um, and then um, as far as like having that support group, I mean, basically for her, that support group is just kind of making sure we're picking her up when she has mommy or daddy so sweetly. But Definitely for our kids, making sure we have those like one-on-one -on -one date time for both Cynthia and I, for the individual kids. Like, you know, whether it's going to get ice cream with dad or, you know, going to the store with just with mom, that one-on-one -on -one time is kind of the thing we're going to really strive well, for, even with the large numbers. We have a question gotcha. just for you. Um, if you had to pick one advice for new newlyweds or a young married couple, what advice would you give Karen? Um, well, I'm pretty green myself. Um, so as far as being in the business, um, that thing your spouse or, you know, person you're engaged to does that annoys you, um, it's going to continue and it's going to get worse unless there's a communication talking about it. Because the number one thing I told Cynthia between myself and her was like, I can't necessarily always promise you I'm going to be like able to deliver on the demands you have of me but I'm always going to try. And I thought I was a relatively clean person. And like, I just realized now I don't know what clean means. Um, not, not, too much not too much information, please, <laughs> Kieran. There are children watching this, this, this program. Huh? <laughs> of course, of course. Um, yeah, so I mean, just those expectations as long as you're going to be in a crucible to each other, you're going to see like parts and your worst parts so up, up close and personal that just recognizing like your calling isn't to, you're not called to succeed, you're called to try. And that that constant effort, that constant trying is what it honestly can make, make or break it. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome to stay with us if you want to, but if the monks need you and you need to go back to work, we, we will understand. Thank you, thank you so much.
Kieran O'Donnell. Yes. Helen, Helen Alvore, I, I have a question just for you. Now, back in 2015, uh, you, it was during the, the Second Synod on the Family, you wrote an article, I think it was for America Magazine, and it was entitled, How Do We Make the Goals of the Synod on the Family a Reality? Now, what if I, if I paraphrased that question for you and asked you, um, how do we make the goals of Amoris Laetitia a reality? Wow, small question, thank you. Uh, <laughs> a couple of things. One is, I think we have to make it convincing in our parishes, to our local bishops and our schools, uh, at the, to the extent you have a national bishops conference, uh, that the family is an important question. And, you know, we have so much fabulous, but maybe so oft repeated church language about it that, you know, it comes in here and it might, might just go out here. <laughs> um, my sort of professorial approach to this is that we, we have to make the case from both faith and reason together. And it's, I remember just in the United States some years ago, the state of Oklahoma put out a press release that said that like X percent of the economy of Oklahoma is being set back by the fact that our family lives are not strong here. I, I think the case for the family, it's not a case against anyone. We're not here judging things that don't match the, 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 the ideal family. We are trying to help people to move toward that um, but I think we have to make the strong case that whatever noise is going on politically <clears throat> or within the church itself politically, that we, we can't take our eye off this ball. It's, it goes to the heart of human identity, success, progress, relationships with people, relationships with society, et cetera. Second, um, Amoris Letizia did a good job and it's very pastoral, I, I second so much um, uh, what's been said on that. But um, I don't think a lot of people can actually grasp in their, their normal brains how the relationship between the persons of the Trinity and Christ's love for the church is what we're trying to do in the family. I, I think people, they have heard that a million times and I don't think they know what to do with it. And again, this is a statement of why it's theologically, pastorally, spiritually important. And I think I'm writing a book on this, so partly this is my hobby horse. It's relating this to the law of religious freedom and our explicating as Catholics, not only to courts, but courts of public opinion, why the things that we do about family in our Catholic institutions are so important to our church as a whole. <clears throat> They're not some separate purity code hanging out there for target practice. Right? They're, they're important. So I think a better explication of this, you know, a, a, a setting out of John Paul II's, the, the body and then the family makes visible what is invisible. If a person does not have an, an experience in the family of a love that is too good to be true, how do they know God can provide that? How do they know that what that looks like and what that feels like and how to do it themselves? So those are just a couple of my favorites, and I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, please, please don't stop. And we're, we're looking forward to, to seeing your book when it comes out. Um, Timothy, you, you've written, you're, a, you're an author, when you, when you write and you give talks also all over, um, on the importance of Catholic education in the family, you often speak about the challenge of how when young people go off to college, they risk deconstructing, that's the word you use, deconstructing what was taught to them by their families. So how do you address, as, as president of, of a Catholic college, of Christendom College, how do you address that deconstruction in your own experience as an educator? Well, that's a great question, Sean, thank you. Of course, part of the thing I think Helen hit on earlier is that the, the preparation for marriage has to start a lot earlier than college years. Um, this is something that should be communicated at church schools and where, where we could do this, uh, you know, in the grammar school experience, in the high school experience. But what, it is something pivotal. It's a pivotal moment when you come to college. I think for most young people, you're independent, you're out of the home, you're making decisions on your own, and everyone has to deal, when it comes to the faith, 
in a fundamental way, do I really believe this? Do I really accept this? I mean, mom and dad did this, but is this really going to be something I'm going to take ownership and make my own? And so to, to be in a position where you're at a, a Catholic school or university, where I think one of the things we have here at, at Christendom and other good schools like ours is that you, you try to communicate in the theology courses or in philosophy courses a proper understanding of a, a Christian anthropology. What does it really mean to be a human being? That we have a nature that is given to us. And so when you have the truths of natural, re that we can know with our natural reason, and those can be augmented and strengthened by what we can know from faith. When you're doing theology and philosophy properly, it really ends up not deconstructing, but convincing in a more profound, deeply intellectual and maybe spiritual way, what mom and dad were saying all along. Or if you came from a broken home, you begin to see why the church teaching really makes sense in this particular area. You know, one of the big things that's really true uh, when we lose sight of the creator, Vatican II said, the creature vanishes. But when God is part of that, we recognize we are creatures. We have a gift. We've been given a nature. And there's certain things that make for human thriving and make for human happiness. And so in a program where you're actually doing a philosophy of human nature, when you're doing metaphysics, you're studying Catholic doctrine or Catholic sacramental life, those things can be so enriching and I've seen, I've been here now for 35 years, the impact that it's had on graduates, the people who do this. So when you do what the church asks, you know, in terms of bringing faith and reason into a fruitful union, and you have a faculty that do that, and in a sense, aren't just professors, but are mentors, where there's a personal interest taken in the student's learning, that all provides a very powerful vortex, if you will, that can really help young people who are struggling and asking questions to find their moorings and find out, well, what can I really know and what is this really all about? Kieran, you're still there. I, I can see you. Um, you. You attended Christendom College, right? Mm -hmm. How much how much of what the, the president of the college has just said resonates with you? What was your experience? I mean, 100% true, honestly. And obviously, I had a good background, but a lot of the, you know, so, well, I want to say a lot. Some of the classmates I have either came from a broken home or it was right there. There was all kinds of background. But the thing that made the college experience so unique, having that curriculum, that understanding of Christian anthropology, we weren't passing ships in the night. Our discussions weren't just my philosophy with a big board, just like going back and forth. It was, we all understand a certain common set of truths. And from there, we can go to conclusions, reflect on our own lives, discuss what happened in our past life and how to kind of grow from that and go beyond that. And that was something utterly unique in my opinion. Kathy, there's, there's a question here maybe for you. Um, Couples who value marriage oftentimes, oftentimes also value children. How important is it to help others value children in order to help them value marriage? It's, it's a little, little contorted, but, but as, the, as a mother of, of nine children, you, you homeschooled several of your children, didn't you? Yes, I did. The youngest three I homeschooled. So, and, and we did that because part of one of the most important things when you're raising children, of course, is their education when they're young. And there's this struggle, especially with the way our society is now, to besides give them a good education, in a certain sense, while they're young, to protect their innocence. And I've even had experience with some of my older children where, because they, I was maybe too trusting of schools and friends, uh, certain things happen. So um, I think that's something that um, like parents' generation they are probably more attuned to and realize now because uh, you, you want to be able to raise your children while they're young so that they can maintain some innocence and be protected and strengthened. So what then the time comes and they're armed, then they can go out and, you know, engage the world and take it on. Um, so so, so uh, here we are. What, what advice for those parents who want to do exactly that, who want to give their children a solid, strong grounding in the faith, but, but they're confused. They may even be overwhelmed 
at times by the pressures coming from outside the family, through, through the media, through technologies? Well, you know, and this is where we have to uh, pull on the grace of our vocation. God is not asking us to do anything that he's not going to provide the grace for. So I would say, obviously, first, pray. I mean, this is pray to God, show me these people, show me this community, show me these friends who can help strengthen me in my raising of my family. Um, so that is what uh, then I think he's not going to be outdone in generosity. He does come through. He put in certain people in my time in certain lives. I could not have homeschooled my children had I not had other mentors who they were already homeschooling their children. And that thing we, but it is something that's very important to the couple, to, uh, to us as a family. So because education was so important, we did go through the experience of a Catholic school, a public school, a private school, a Baptist school, finally a community started <laughs> school, and homeschool. So you can see we were struggling, but you do, it's hard, but sometimes you do have to go through these hoops um, because it's, it is so important for your children. Well, yeah, and I, would, I would just reckon that also because sometimes there's this tension, you want people to see how beautiful children are, but we're very, there is no perfect family. Everybody struggles, everyone has wounds, and sometimes they're this good. We need to be the ideal perfect family. No, you have to have the strength and the humility to say, Look, we've messed up here. This is a disaster, you know. And so that takes a huge burden off people if they don't feel they have to have the perfect family. There is no such thing as, well, maybe the holy family. But other, I think Joseph must have had a tough time getting his morning coffee, walking down to see the Son of God and the Immaculate Conception at the breakfast table. That must have been pretty awkward for him to go through. But there is no perfect family. So in a, in a very real sense, get that monkey off your back, be yourself, let them see the struggle because oftentimes the struggle uh, and the forgiveness and the difficulty you see that you're coping, that's part of the beauty. And I, and I do think when you see that kind of beauty, someone, they care so much, they're going through hell because they love their kids that in itself can be a powerful witness to the beauty of what it means to be a family. And Sean, you touched on something about having children. Right, I totally, I totally, I totally I agree. Did, I was, I wanna... It was the question, yes. Um, that it, it's, it's kind of funny in a way because having children is such a natural good. It is, you don't have to, after you've had a baby, that miracle of life. It is a natural good. It's almost like there have been so many, there's forces in media, wherever out there that, it, that, you know, the difficulties, how bad it might be, how hard it is, or, you know, you're, it, you've had disappointments in your own life. But I think just if you listen in your own heart to the natural good and beauty, I mean, after all, it is the miracle of life because you of love that I, I think just strengthening that in a very normal way. Uh, and, and once you live it, you see it. It's, it's kind of funny to, feel like you have to convince somebody how great it would be to have children. I think some of the objections come and we've, we've all heard them. It's that there's a choice. Uh, am I going to be a parent or am I going to be a, a professional? Helen, you've managed, it seems, to balance that choice extraordinarily well. You you are a mother and, and you have uh, an extraordinary professional career. What, what is your advice? What, what do you have to say? Oh, boy. Um, First, I think the word balance is not the right word. <clears throat> the kids okay. uh, had to come first in, in very um, in intense, radical ways. Um, second, I um, never worked really went after the money. I, I felt vocationally called and I, um, I am the queen of the secondhand everything. Craigslist and the Salvation Army built my wardrobe and my house. So I tried to keep the material things so I didn't need to go for money. Um, and I was very fortunate. I mean, really, I thank God every day that an academic career <clears throat> could be put, you know, the timing was perfect for my, for my children. Um, so the children first, don't, don't do the money. <laughs> And, and try to pick something, and if you are working, that works with the kids first. As a one, one last, well, let's, how much, oh, we have, we still have a couple of minutes left. So, so a last, a last question to sort of throw out to, to all of you. As, as a communicator, um, I have to ask if we, 
is, is there a different way that we can be talking about the family? Um, is, is, there a, is there a more positive way? Going back to Amoris Letizia, another favorite line of mine, we've often been on the defensive, it says, wasting pastoral energy on denouncing a decadent world without being proactive in proposing ways to find true happiness. Any final ideas on how we might achieve that? Can I say Kathy's line about natural good is perfect? Like everything is, I saw a headline that said something like, um, you know, uh, families with children spend a lot of money or something. I mean, it was just so <laughs> negative that we know it's what people want. The point is how to make it possible how we support our own kids in doing it, how the state does, how the corporate does. We have to assume it's a good and demand that people support it. Um, it. Just, we know this is the kind of love people crave. That's what the word family means to them, is always there. So I, I just think we have to start from that and start making demands. So I think that's I a great way to end, area, yes, last. Mm -hmm. One area is um, in art, so obviously in uh, movies or TV shows, which are not what you look to normally, but, and they, they can't be cheesy, they have to be real. But I mean, there are incredible stories of families that can be told that just, just by telling a story and telling the truth of a story that, that it, it shows people a beauty of a family. Thank you, Timothy. And I think there is something about the beauty of marriage and family, including the natural goods. Everyone is seeking a love that will last forever, that will be faithful. And I think this is something that our church and the natural good of marriage seeks to provide for everyone. So I think one of the things that we have not done is communicate the incredible beauty. We're wringing our hands, we're looking at this, that, and those are real things and they have to be dealt with. But I think one of the best things that he said was also, it's not so much dealing with the failures, but what can we do to build and strengthen for the future, couples for the future? And I think communicating the beauty and also the fact that there will be support that will be found for those difficult times, but it's worth launching out on the voyage because to have a love that will last forever, only you, exclusive forever, is a beautiful goal and it's something that can be achieved with the help of grace. I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart for all these beautiful insights and, and sharing of experiences for your contributions, Helen and Kathy and Timothy and Kieran. But before you go, there's just one last thing. Um, I'd like you and those participating in this conversation to, to hear this message from the prefect of the Dicastery for Laity, Family and Life. He's Cardinal Kevin Farrell. Pope Francis has charged the Dicastery with organizing the Amoris Laetitia family year. So I think it's only fair that we do leave the very last word to them, Cardinal Kevin Farrell. I invite the whole Catholic community, bishops, priests, religious, members of conse consecrated members and members of all ecclesial communities to come together during this year and to work towards creating new ideas, new ways of doing things, new practical applications of this great apostolic exhortation as we regenerate the life of the family in our society today. The joy of the gospel is found also in the family. The gospel found also in the family. From all of us here at Rome Reports, our journalists and reporters and editors and technical staff, and from me, Sean Patrick Lovett, thank you so much for joining us. God bless and see you soon.